All right, so I am John, also known as John the Verbose, and, uh, and I'm representing the tradition of the Reformed Druids of North America. And so, and I've, I've been involved with the, Reform, with the Reformed Druids since 2011. And, uh, and then I also planned the 50th anniversary of the Reform in 2013. And so that was a really, really big event. But I want to start before the Reformed Druids even began. Uh, but, I mean, in a nutshell, what Reformed Druid is, is it, the, the Druidism aspect is a philosophy that can be applied to one's current spiritual practices um, if your current spiritual practices are compatible. Um, and so this was actually created by a bunch of college students in, at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota in 1963. And it's among the contemporary Druid orders, it's probably the only one well, I mean, you could probably even find other traditions that this applies to, but it's the only modern tradition in which the figurehead is a young, possibly relatively inexperienced 20-something. So whoever the current Archdruid of Carleton College is, is like the person that the Reform looks to. And so as the Reform Druids, I mean, I don't have any affiliation with Carleton College. I've never been a student there, but... Um, but it's branched out so far that it's a, like anyone can find it and it's accessible to, to everyone beyond just the college students. But as the older Reformed Druids age, they still look to the current Archdruid at Carleton College. So that is probably one of the more peculiar uh, aspects of Reformed Druidry. Uh, so the state of Druidism in the 1960s in America was almost non-existent. Uh, you did have, at the time, the precursor to AODA, which at the time their name was the Ancient Order of Masonic Druids in America, and, uh, and so they were more, they were an offshoot of Masonic Orders, and then they were, they were more kind of the academic elite. Yes? Masonic Orders such as the Masonic Temple and all that, or... Um, more like Freemasons, the That's just right. secret societies in general, and um, and I believe they m they may have had some interaction with the Druid revival movement as well. Okay. Um, and so there's there's actually no knowledge of that as a Druid order at the time when when the Reformed Druids were started. And so our main founder, his name was David Fisher, and in the 1950s and early 1960s he was actually in an offshoot of Freemasonry called the Order of de Molay. And that is basically Freemasonry for kids. And so a lot of people, like, if they're in the Order of de Molay, once they become an adult, then they would likely continue on into being a, an all-out Freemason. Um, and so the Order of de Molay is actually, uh, they do have... Um, someone who is a, like a, an overseer that is a Freemason, and, and they're kind of, <laughs> kind of, not the babysitter per se, but kind of a chaperone and a, and a guide. And, um, and so the, the kids are doing rituals and ceremonies and stuff. And, and so that is where David Fisher was coming from. And he went to Carleton College, and he, he wanted to create a secret society there. And he, cre well, he tried creating a fraternity, but fraternities are not allowed at Carleton, and so that whole thing failed. He tried out creating other secret clubs and, um, and secret societies, and it just never got off the ground. Um, and in 1963, there was this new mandate uh, from the administration that in order to get credit and graduate, you have to go to a certain number of, of chapel services um, and, and have the chaplain sign off on an attendance form, and then you turn that into your dean. And, um, and so even in 1963, Carleton College was a little bit open-minded, and they said that if you were to take it to like a synagogue or the Buddhist temple up in Minneapolis, which was the closest one at the time, that if you get 
some of their clergy to sign off that you were there. Um, and you have to do it, I think it was like at least 12 times over the academic year, um, then that would count towards your credit. And so Fisher would actually later go into the seminary. But so he, he was a very spiritual person already, and he really objected to being coerced into going to a chapel service because to him, if you're forced to do something, that takes away from its value. And so he wanted, he was kind of, he was really protesting that, and he got, up, got some like-minded like people together, and they started having their own meetings, trying to figure out, it's like, well, what can, they, what can they do to protest this? And like, he said, well, let's just have our own services and turn in our slips. And, and so they were going out into the woods and, and making up these rituals, and they didn't really know what to call it. And so they, there was one person in their group, um, Howard Cherniak, and he said that, he suggested that they take on the word, the, the name of Druids. And so he said that in surveys that his parents fill out, like, um, uh, um, what's the one every 10 years? The, the census. census. census, thank you. Um, in the census, they would fill out Druid. And they were actually, uh, they were actually a Jewish family, but they put Druid down. And that was just something they did, probably for anonymity. But, um, and so that's what Howard Cherniak suggested. And, so, and they were like, and plus it's like, we're doing rituals outside. That's what the ancient Druids did, right? And so they started doing research in the, in the campus library, and, uh, and they were finding as many books as they could find on, on historical research and, and the Druids, and they inevitably found books on the Druid revival movement as well. And so Fisher was uh, probably taking inspiration from Fraser's Golden Bough. And, uh, and so one of, there's, like one of the reformed druid deities I'll cover coming up, but we think that the they borrowed the name from uh, the druid revival movement, and it's kind of, it's very obscure and it, and it has some interesting connections. But um, but in their research, I mean, it, this was at a time that they still thought Stonehenge was for the druids. They didn't really even know the the exact date of it, and so the just the knowledge of druidry or ancient Druids in the 1960s, was next to nothing uh, by comparison. I mean, we still don't even have a whole lot of information on it today. And so they're really in the dark. And they thought, well, what we're doing, we, we probably don't deserve to call what we're doing Druidry. And so they're like, well, how about Reformed Druidry? Because we, this is a significant departure from the old ways. And so that word became their caveat and and they they took it and went with that and so none of the founders were actually pagan like david fisher he was um episcopalian and howard cherniak was jewish and there were others uh like some were uh atheists and agnostics and uh, other christians and and so that was the core of their early group and so when they were creating this out of whole cloth they went with a, a universalist approach. It has a very panentheistic cosmology, and so and it, with a little bit of pantheism as well. So they, uh, pantheism is where they would ha have all gods as the aspect of one, uh, in a nutshell. And the panentheistic is that that this deity is somehow like omnipresent but separate from from everyone at the same time. And so the deities that they would use were a mishmash of deities from different Celtic cultures. So they're really mixing, which they, they had Gaulish sources and Irish, and, uh, and then there was Welsh influence as well. Uh, and so, but the, it focused on the Earth Mother. The Earth Mother was considered, it's considered to be the physical manifestation of deity. And so they had other uh, Celtic deities like Granos, the, uh, the god of healing springs, uh, Brachiaca, uh, god of malt, um, 
it might be a goddess. I'd have to double check that. Um, and then uh, there's Belenos, a Gaulish solar deity, um, Tyrannus, the thunder deity, and uh, and uh, and they had a few more up from from that one. But they they really focused on on that handful, and those are all just to them they were aspects of the Earth Mother, and nature with a capital N, and. Um, and then there was this other entity, Baal, and Baal is what they must have found in their revivalist literature. And so it's B-E apostrophe A-L, and, and I've, I wrote down the book of where I've seen that somewhere, and I can't remember where it was, so I'd have to start over to, to um, find out what that book was. But... Um, but Linguistically, it's it it's the Irish an archaic Irish word for Lord, and it is a cognate to the Mesopotamian word uh, that was identified with Baal and all other deities that started with Baal. And so, Baal in the Mesopotamian traditions are, is more of a title. It's like Lord, and then it follows up with of something, um, and so is a linguistic connection to the to the original word but to them it was like to the christians in the, in that druid group it was uh it was the god and to others it could have been identified like source is a really good concept for baal it is the abstract creative forces within the universe whether it is just pure physics uh and the science of the cosmos or some sort of deity that's that's pulling all the strings um and so with that universalist approach, everyone was open to interpreting it in a way that meshed with what their current worldview was. And, and so it brought together a lot of people. And, uh, and so they were making these rituals of, um, that really resembled a, a communion. And they could draw it out and make it 45 minutes long. Um, they also made it, since it was really... Um, heavy into ritual, uh, they would have ordinations. And that's kind of, they would have three main orders. And it's just the first order, second order, and third order, which is comparable to uh, circles in, in Wiccan traditions. But, um, but they made it a lot easier. It's a lot more watered down as to what you have to do to enter the orders. Um, and and so the other thing that made them reformed is that, unlike the ancient druids that didn't write down anything, th these reformed druids were writing down their history, their customs, their bylaws, and all of their rituals. And, uh, and so, because it's like they didn't really have the time, they didn't want to put too much effort into this thing, because they also have to focus on, on academics as well. Um, and... So Beltane of 1963 was was their first ritual, and uh, and it went fairly well, and uh, and so then they had well the first altar they had out at their um, Beltane ritual was just a portable record player that was covered with a white cloth, and they said that it, it really doesn't do the service justice, and so um, as part of the ritual they. Uh, they built a stone altar, and at the time, the campus had plenty of loose uh, stones from uh, from older Victorian era buildings that were torn down, and and so they built the stone altar from the from this rubble, and and so they thought that that was that was a lot better than their portable record player, and so in their in their ritual, there are hymns and praises to the Earth Mother and. And it's looking back, and this is Isaac Bonowitz's opinion, really, too, that it's hard to deny that it looks very overtly pagan, what they were doing, even though um, at the time a lot of them uh, um, would reject that notion or, or bristle at the thought of that. Um, and so they, they made it so formal because they wanted to be accepted with, with the... I mean, David Fisher was signing the chapel attendance slips, for them, and so people were taking them to to their deans, and um, and so they wanted to look like they're making an effort, they're doing something formal, and they wanted the recognition for it. 
And so they even established a Grove Constitution, which is kind of like a charter that, that ADF uses today. And, and, and so it formalized the name and the laws and the, the beliefs. And there are only two basic beliefs in Reformed Druidry. And that's so that it can embrace a wide variety of, of people. And so to be a Reformed Druid, like you have to want to be one. And it's kind of the, I think it's an unwritten tenet of belief. It's like you want to identify as one. But the first tenet is that the object of spiritual truth, which is a universal and a never-ending search, may be found through the Earth Mother, which is nature. But this is one way among many. And the second tenet is, and great is the importance, which is of a spiritual importance, of nature. And with it, men do live, even as we struggle through life, do we come face to face with it. And so that was an awfully verbose way of, of saying that spirituality can be found and expressed in nature, and that the second one can be paraphrased as, nature is important to my spirituality. And so a lot of, I mean, that's the way I paraphrase it. Um, the most popular way is, to paraphrase both tenets is nature is good. <laughs> and so some people thought, it's like, well, it doesn't always do things that are viewed as good. And so they're like, okay, how about nature is nature? <laughs> and so the agnostics in the group really liked that interpretation. But, uh, but the tenets, uh, I, I like the long form of the tenets <laughs> myself. Um, and so, as David Fisher was signing all these chapel attendance slips for everyone who attended, the, uh, there were two deans at, uh, at Carleton College, Dean of Men and the Dean of Women. And the Dean of Women was accepting uh, all the slips and granting the, um, all the women credit for it. And the Dean of Men, uh, he, set, uh, he kind of set a double standard. He rejected... Uh, all of the all of the men's attendance slips, mm -hmm. and so he was basically saying that I'm I've been appointed to this position because I am I am, I am more intelligent than you, and the, and it's my judgment that we're not going to accept this because it doesn't it just it's not acceptable in our sight, and I'm just arbitrarily rejecting it. And so Howard Cherniak, who was actually studying. To go to become um, an attorney, he was studying law. He was very good at, at argument, so he spent hours and hours with the dean of men, like arguing their case, and so it was continually rejected by the dean of men, regardless. Uh, and so the druids thought, well, it's like we we still we're still winning because right now we are claiming re religious discrimination, and if they are finally accepted then we will call ourselves out on our own hoax and we will disband. And, we're, and it's just going to be denouncing the religious, the, the mandatory chapel attendance. And so either way, they viewed it as a win-win situation. And, uh, and they just continued doing what they were doing. And services were held every Saturday uh, at noon. And... And when it was daylight saving time, they would actually adjust for solar noon, so it would be one in the afternoon when the sun is straight up in, in the sky. And David Fisher, the Episcopalian, also would be conducting weather magic. And it apparently would do his bidding. So the Saturday after Beltane, it was overcast, and Fisher prayed at the Druid altar to the Earth Mother, and he asked for the weather to clear out. And so according to our mythology, which, and I've spoken to some who were there, they said that this absolutely did happen, but it was overcast, there was a break in the clouds, the ray of light shines at them, and then after, by two hours later, there were no clouds in the sky. And so... It was taken to be a sign. Omens are a very important thing in Reformed Druidry. And, uh, and so there were some attendees who observed this, and they were upset that this weather magic had worked. And so they were starting to see something. It just seemed like it was a little too dark for them. And 
so they came and, well, it was later found out that their altar was destroyed in the night and it was done by some of these people that were, that had kind of scoffed at this, the weather magic that had happened. And so the altar was rebuilt and then it was destroyed the very next night by a bunch of students that, probably the same students and that the, apparently, according to our mythology, they were also drunk. And this was the first time in our literature that there's a reference to the anti-Druid. So it's, that took inspiration from the phrase the Antichrist. But the anti-Druid is basically anyone who is doing anything or speaking, speaking or doing things against the Druids. And so the th they, built, they built the altar the third time, and this time they used mortar to set the stones. And a, they place a curse on the altar... And the curse seems to be relatively effective in the short term. That one of their, uh, the known anti-Druids, uh, happened to sprain his ankle. And, and it was, though it was an athletic incident, they still took it to be a sign because they put a curse on their altar and somehow retroactively it punished somebody who had destroyed the previous one. And, um, and so... Then, as these rituals are going on, they're making them more and more elaborate. So as they're making the rituals more elaborate, they thought, well, shouldn't we do something to consecrate the altar? And so they knew from, from what they did have are of these biased accounts of, uh, I think it was probably Tacitus, um, who said that, that blood would be spilled to consecrate the altar, and blood was the most sacred thing. And so... Uh, they they thought, well, we should really just use, let's just use plants. <laughs> let's sacrifice plants on the altar. And then the other half of the Druid group was like, no, we should use blood. And they suggested that they wanted it to be, they wanted to sacrifice a chicken over the altar. And so this caused an immediate divide with between the two halves of the group. And so, and then Howard Cherniak was trying to argue his case again and plead with them. He's like, no, aren't, it's like, don't you remember that we're reformed and we've shed these old ways that are uh, like offensive to us now. Um, and so the group wanting this to sacrifice the chicken, they, they, they relented so that they would stick together. And because they were more concerned that it's like, if they, if they split apart and formed two groups, that a schism would ultimately cause them both to collapse. And so, for the sake of unity, they decided against animal sacrifice, and that was um, pretty much codified into the Reformed Druid tradition. Things, the, the third altar with the curse on it, was it lasted through, uh, through the summer. Because it's like, since Beltane, I think they had academic courses until mid-June. And so they had plenty of time, like week after week, that they were making these courses more elaborate. And then it was time to go home. And, and the altar survived through their return in the, next, in the coming fall of 1963. And nothing really happened until Samhain when they decided to have a really big ritual. And this was at, at a time when they had about 50 people in attendance. And so they were farther back into the woods on the campus, and they were in a place that is now called the Druid's Den. It is officially named for the Druids on the campus. And at the time, they called it the Little Grove, and it's this nice hollow place with a fire pit. And that's where they had their Samhain ritual. Uh, and so there they were doing some... They are really experimenting at this time, and they were scrying into molten lead. And so I think that's called um, molybdomancy. And so they were casting the molten lead on the ground and, and making predictions and taking omens from it. And, uh, and then others were speaking in tongues or, or otherwise known as glossolalia. And, and uh, the, things were getting more and more interesting and, until suddenly their seer suddenly had a vision, and as she was describing this, everyone came silent and was just listening in. And she said that she sees a lot of people 
in a round room, and they're all crying in front of a coffin that's in the middle of this round room. And, um, and so she's like, someone has died. Uh, as she's continuing to scry, she, realizes, she, she proclaims that it's the president. And so this was Halloween of 1963. So what happened later in November 22nd, but JFK was assassinated. That hit home for the Reformed Druids on such a deep level that they almost fell apart completely again. They only had like a core handful of people that didn't abandon everything. People, everyone remembered the night of that prediction, and it was too close for comfort, and it seemed like they weren't sure if it... They started to think that what they were doing was black magic, and, and, and this was the 1963 mindset, that it's like everything is suddenly now evil, and they can't do this anymore, and so the, the group nearly fell apart. And so then who, the, the remnant of the Reformed Druids was like, all right, we don't really want to fall apart like this, so let's just kind of stay away from this, this dark stuff. <laughs> and, and so they haven't banned it outright, but they, just for the sake of, of sticking together, they, they were trying to be less dire. And, so, and then over the winter, uh, in, traditionally... I think it's the Minnesota winter that Reformed Druids will do less. <laughs> and plus there's the winter break. They were going home, so they didn't really have a celebration for, uh, for the winter solstice. And this, this has definitely changed over time. Um, and so it was the harsh winter that in the spring when they came out, they noticed that it, the elements had really damaged the altar, and it was just the mortar was separating from the stones and it, it, it didn't look good. And so this was the time that the Druids decided to rebuild the altar and they were going to make it the best one ever. And so they built it so that they could have a fire underneath and there was a hole in the center for like the smoke to go through and they would offer their, the sacrifices um, through the hole. And so at this point when it was, um, it was plant sacrifices only, uh, it was usually oak, oak leaves or oak branches and sometimes something seasonal. And, uh, and so when they were making the altar, it, by the time it was done, they knew that it was, uh, it was too soon. Like the, alt, the, the mortar was too soft for them to just leave it. And they wanted somebody to guard it overnight. And so there was uh, David, David the Chronicler. And uh, so we have David Fisher and... We have David Franquist, who is known as David the Chronicler, and that was that's kind of his druid craft name. And mine has taken kind of inspiration as John the Verbose. Uh, it's like your first name, and then you have a title, the something. And so a lot of Reformed druids have followed that pattern after, uh, because like even David Fisher was is actually referred to David who was a Fisher, and and um, and so it just kind of carried on from that for people who would prefer anonymity in their writings. Um, and so David the Chronicler volunteered that he would stay up overnight just guarding the altar while the mortar sets. And, um, and so he did that, and he had a small fire beside it, and he was meditating into it. And, and, these are, uh, and his meditations finally actually made it into a book that he named the Book of Meditations. And for somebody who is probably 19 or 20 years old, it was incredibly profound from, from what I've seen. And it's like, I'm, I read it today and I'm like, I, a college kid wrote this? And, uh, and so that was probably one of the most meaningful books that I had discovered um, in, uh, in my experience as a Reformed Druid. And, uh, but as compensation for him uh, guarding the altar overnight. They ordained him to the third order. And so he was already a second order druid at the time. And so in the morning he had his ordination ser service. And it was after that that they decided to make up a whole bunch of higher orders that corresponded to the other deities. And so it was kind of like an area of focus um, that, uh, that they made orders above the third order, the fourth through the tenth. And 
And so in doing so, they had this interesting process for a for creating this this tradition in that uh, they they did this all in a single afternoon that they would appoint like some everyone in the third order would appoint someone uh, to the next higher order and so they appointed David Fisher as he was like their leader they appointed him to the uh, the order of Granos and he became its patriarch and so once and it took a minimum of three votes and luckily there were three of them there at the time uh, that were in the third order and so they ordained him to the third order or they appointed him, and he ordained them all into the order so that they were each in the order of Granos, or the fourth order. And so they continued this process, and they appointed someone else as the patriarch of the order of Brachiaca. And so they kind of did this, una this cycle of unanimous voting and appointing until they got to the seventh order, which is the order of Serona. And... Um, and so each one had its own written ritual of ordination. And the seventh order <laughs> ordination, the order of Serona, was, had probably one of the more interesting ordination methods to it. And it, I'd say it, it resembles a little bit of a hazing. But uh, there's all this wordy pro, all the, these, the wordy prose and, and poetry is there and, and pageantry. And at the end... Well, Serona is, uh, is the consort of Granos. And so, Granos being the god of the healing springs, Serona was the goddess of lakes and rivers. And so they were on this island on a lake that's on campus, and called it's Lyman Lakes. And they were on uh, Mayfet Island, which uh, has, I think it was like the, the May Festival, which actually, before the Druids were there, it had a maypole, and now it no longer does, but... Um, but from this island, the person who was uh, ordained to the order of Serona was then cast into the water. And, and so he was thrown into the, the lake as his uh, rite of passage. And, um, and I'd say that's probably tied for the most dangerous ordination. With Like the second, ordina second order ordination can get kind of dangerous as, as well, but... Uh, but that's probably as dangerous as it gets in Reformed Druidism. Um, and it was after, at that point, they're like, okay, what, when do we stop? And so they decided, it's like, to what end are we making all these higher orders? Because they had filled them out up to ten, but they, they decided to just stop at the seventh order for that time. Um, and so when it comes to the ordinations, the, like the first order Druid has to... Uh, they want to be in the first order, and they just have to agree to the two basic tenets of Reformed Druidism. And so that's, and then they partake of the waters of life, which in our tradition is diluted whiskey. And so, and then of course they understood from the beginning that there are people that for whatever reason might not be allowed to, to have whiskey or alcohol, and so they would always make um, some sort of alternative arrangement, but uh, which does make the second order uh, ritual of initiation interesting is that um, they have a few additional charges that you have to accept um, and that you do have to have at least like a, a basic uh, comprehension of reformed druidry which doesn't which I mean even to them it didn't take a whole lot and uh, and so but then the rite of passage is that you partake of a chalice of undiluted whiskey and they didn't really say how much it was, but it's like you're, it's they'd fill the chalice, whatever size it was, and you have to drink all of it. And so I thought that could be really dangerous for some people who are willing to do that. And so with um, with my grove, we were trying to settle on something that's reasonable but effective. And so I figured a hundred milliliters um, is probably good. And and because I think I, the one time that I used more than that. Um, one of my Grove members had to sit down for about 20 minutes, <laughs> and he's a big guy, and, and so he's like, that was a lot of whiskey. So, so I was like, yeah, we're going to change that just a little bit, make it safer. Um, and then to enter the Third Order, uh, this is probably one of the most time-honored traditions in Reformed Druidry, and that is that you have to have an all-night vigil 
awake in nature. And so in the, in the 21st century, that even means like separated from technology. I, um, when I had my third order ordination, I wasn't even allowed to have a watch to tell what time it was. And that made a lot of sense to me. And though I did have some assigned readings that I was supposed to read by the firelight um, at specified times during the night. And they're all, they're sealed with uh, a wax seal and, it, and then there was a, my name on it and a time. And so I had like a reading at 9 o'clock, midnight, 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. And, and I was like, how am I supposed to tell what time it is? And I was like, ah, that's part of my challenge, isn't it? And, um, and so as long as you're, it's like, okay, so you're, you're not allowed to have anything but, um, but water or tea. Um, so for the rest of the night, you're supposed to be fasting. And if it's a hot summer night, then they understand it's like they want you to, to like stay hydrated and, and not die. Um, because I think one of the other important things is like, don't die on your, on your all night vigil. But, um, but food is not allowed. Um, and, uh, um, and then no mind altering substances at all. And, and I found that it's just with the sleep deprivation and the fasting, it's easy to enter an altered state of mind just on entirely on your own during that. And they say that it's like strange things will occur during your vigil. And I wasn't sure if that's like, are people going to be like setting up Blair Witch style pranks out in the woods for me? Or, or is this going to be completely supernatural? And so I had, uh, I had like four different things happen over my vigil that were, uh, that were completely supernatural. And at, at one point, I think it was because I was tired, it looked like all the trees were wrapped in snow fences. And, and I'd get closer to them and the snow fences would disappear. <laughs> and, and then I would hear, it's like I was hearing um, women's voices talking as if they were like 10 feet away and they were talking over each other. And, and so I looked to where they were, that sound was coming from and of course there's nobody there. And, uh, and so it was like every, it was like each of my senses had this unique experience. And, uh, and so, and then in the morning at sunrise, the, um, the third order druid who is presiding over, um, uh, your ordination will, will come and determine that, that if you had passed their test or not. And, um, and then you don't have to be completely alone in your vigil. You can, um, you can have vigils, like you can have multiple people vigil with you, though it is good to have times during that, that you are alone, that you can meditate, and uh, and it's very introspective as well, and uh, and the presiding third order druid is is also supposed to come and visit you a, cu a couple of times, and they might have um, something thoughtful for you to meditate on, or they might just be checking on the firewood or bringing more, and um, and then of course making sure you're not falling asleep. At the with the third order ordination, that is the ritual that is the the only thing that is um, not openly published, and that was something that was it's not meant to be a secretive tradition, but that's just kind of how it happened. And they're like, you know, wouldn't it be more meaningful if you don't have access to the ritual until you are being ordained, and making it um, all the more of a surprise, and. Um, and so with that, there's also our ritual that, that um, David Frankwist, uh, who is the, David the Chronicler, he had all written and put, put this together. And it was all in separate books early on. And it got lost over, over the years because in the late 70s, somebody graduated without ordaining someone else to it and then just interest kind of disappeared. They knew there was that legacy of, of the Druids on the campus. And other, like all the Druids that had graduated beforehand, uh, they had gone wherever and started their own groves. So it was still happening other places. And Isaac Bonowitz had gotten involved, and, and, um, and once he was ordained to the Third Order, that's when he wanted us to come out of the broom closet and admit that we're pagans. And, 
Uh, and so because he, he was met with a lot of opposition to that, and so that's why he started creating offshoots. He created the new Reformed Druids of North America, and that catered more to uh, the neo people who already were neo-pagans. And, um, and then the, the, there was everyone who was in the, uh, the new Reformed Druids of North America was automatically also a Reformed Druid because they just built on the, the foundation. And so all the third orders are in this, uh, the, the Council of Dalinap Landu. And Dalinap Landu is a strange entity that has no historic reference, but the, uh, the name itself is it's bad Welsh for Lord of the Groves. And, uh, and so some people view this Dalinap Landu as an egregore or uh, a thought form entity that was created by the belief of its celebrants. And, um, and others think that it's, uh, it's just the psychic interconnectedness that all third order druids innately have. Because we call, when, we, when we have our rituals, we call on Dalinap Landu when we're, uh, when we're consecrating the whiskey. We ask him to, to descend into the chalice and hallow the waters. And, um, and so a lot of people that have that second mindset, that it's just the, um, uh, this psychic connection between third order druids, that it's kind of calling on all of the third orders, wherever they are in the world, that that psychically they are or they're consecrating the waters themselves and uh and and that's really open to an interpretation and um and so the third order also has that that name the order of Dallin Aplandu and everyone who's in the third order is automatically in the council and the council used to be a governing body for the reformed druids and that's uh when they made a lot of things uh, legislation and bylaws and and then they thought that the more we try to do with this, the, the more it might be less universalist. Like it might be harder for people to find a way to identify with this. And so ultimately they voted to, um, through, to strip the, their own the power from the council. And so the council still exists, but they no longer have legislative power and all the... Uh, each individual grove is allowed to um, to govern itself, and so even though the archdruid at Carleton College is the one who is looked to for um, for guidance, and at the time they were the chairperson that would make the final decision on everything, um, and this it's and right now it's more kind of for just uh, honorary or ceremonial purposes, and it doesn't have any real uh, power to it. And they think that's a good thing. Um, Isaac wanted to, to give the power back to the council so that they could make more changes. And so they thought it was good that they, they felt protected by their lack of, of power. <laughs> and so that's why he, he started making more and more offshoots and he made the schismatic druids of North America and and he I think he was even working with some people to create the Hasidic druids of North America that in, incorporated um, uh, Jewish mysticism and and uh, and there were other offshoots and and finally he got fed up and later came back with his own druidism and known as ADF but uh, meanwhile at Carlton there was uh, there was a time that they kind of dropped the ball and there were no druids left. And, and there was a group of Wiccans on campus. And, uh, and then it was Selena Fox was visiting in the 1980s for a speech on feminism. And she stayed at one of the, uh, the campus-owned houses that these, this group of Wiccans was living in. And they were having dinner together after she had her presentation. And somebody brought up this shoebox of stuff from the basement and said, you know, we've had this stuff here and we thought it looks kind of interesting. And there's all this, all these books on the reformed Druids. And, um, and so Selena Fox took a look at it and she was like, this is good stuff. You, you guys need to do this. And so she was telling Wiccans to, to be Druids. <laughs> and so they kind of, they had a blended tradition over for the rest of the eighties. And then, Finally, in 1993 was the 30th anniversary, 
And, uh, and then that's when David Franquist, the chronicler, he came back and um, met up with the Reformed Druids and found out that they had dropped the ball. And, and so they, um, they kind of had this jump start. And Franquist uh, ordained the Archdruid who ordained everyone else. And, and they, that tradition has been uh, carrying on since 1993. And, and, um, and, it's, and so now, uh, and it was interesting that on the 30th anniversary, it was the, the current, the Archdruid at the time was the 30th Archdruid. And sometimes they'll have years with multiple serving Archdruids. Like there was this triumvirate of three people that would make decisions together. And, and, uh, and then other years there'd be one or one per semester. But, um, but then it kind of, it drifted a little bit that right now um, in year, uh, year 54 of the reform, um, I think then now we have the 55th Archdruid of Carlton, and so I'm in contact with her, and I also gave her a druid robe. I make druid robes. We have the time, or yeah. oh, I thought, oh, okay, I, I thought you had a <laughs> gesture or something. Um, He's got uh, flashes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it's been expanding, and and it's not an expansionist religion. We don't try to recruit or proselytize. Um, it's just people try to, they, they come to us asking about it, and if it's not for them, they might continue on their own way. But and so it's, it has a very organic feel to it, I think. Um, questions? Yes. How many people are there in our DNA right now? Do you know about how many members? Uh, it is, it was estimated several years ago that there are 4,000. And that, I, I'm thinking that it was taking from a very small sample population for statistical <laughs> purposes and then expanded on. But um, there are, as far as groves, there are about 40 active groves. And I have Oakdale Grove based in the Twin Cities. Um, and Carlton Grove is still active and and then there are some others as well uh as far as i i think the number would actually only be in the hundreds not the thousands okay. but yeah is anybody accepted um like i do some work with wade for the pagan ministry, uh, prison ministry program and i know that some covens groves etc exclude uh, do you have like an exclusion for that, or is anybody? Uh, as far as I know, in the uh, in our tradition, that we don't exclude anyone, um, and it's uh, it's supposed to be embracing of of all cultures, subcultures, walks of life, <laughs> etc. Um, we found that uh, that. People who, I mean, if they're disruptive ones, that they will eventually just go away because they, I think they'll feel that it's not the best fit for them. But we don't, um, we don't push anyone out, and we don't try to ban people, and so yeah. Is your rituals public also? Uh, and that does depend on on the grove, since each grove has their own autonomy. There are some that are not public. And, uh, and so my grove, uh, it, is, uh, it is public, but there are times that we do have a ritual that's just somebody at, at one of my grove mates' uh, backyards. And so for, since it's at a private residence, I consider that a, a private ritual. And I always make sure it's like, hey, somebody new might want to come. Is it okay if it's here? Do you think we should go to a public park? And so most of the time, we try to have it at a public park, um, and with the proximity of the Twin Cities to Northfield being about 45 minutes south um, of the city, uh, we'll also go to Carleton College, and uh, visitors are also allowed at the Arboretum there, and so uh, the campus security is actually aware of the Reformed Druids, and so we're there overnight for our, our um, 
some of our rituals and some of the, the all-night vigils. And <clears throat> so there are two times that the campus security have come up to us uh, during these overnights. And they just want to make sure that, that we're not breaking glass bottles and that we're not drunk and that um, we're being respectful. And they, from their own experience, they know that the ref once you tell them you're with the Druids, then they will... It's like they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. They give us a lot of leniency and, and acceptance. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, yeah, after the yeah, third level initiation being ordained. So has does our DNA ordained druids, do they meet any legal requirements for clergy? Um, is it general? Have specific people kind of pushed down those lines to, you know, to be chaplains or, you know, um, marry, marriage ceremonies, etc. That was one of the things that Isaac was pushing for in the 1970s. Um, and there is, uh, there's no central, since there's no centralized authority, we don't um, ordain people with any legal um, certificates or anything. So that for that, they would probably have to go with a third party if they're going to be, um, to, to be, or like, legally ordained on their own, but they can certainly take on, like if they're ordained to the third order, then they can certainly uh, say that their, uh, their religion is the Reformed Druids. So, and even though Reformed Druidry is not supposed to be a religion, it's supposed to be a philosophy, uh, it, for some people it's a blurred line, and then for some people it's, it is a religion, and it is a philosophy, it's both. Um, so it's kind of an interesting gray area. All right. Awesome. So. Thank you much. Thank you.